Um, Bulavanaka, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> uh, gives me much pleasure to be here. Um, of course, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Chancellor, uh, the other council members who are here, the academics, the lecturers, and the students, and of course, Scope Construction, um, who actually put this building up for us. It's interesting, I was sitting there, I was thinking, in fact, this morning, when I was thinking about what to say, what really <clears throat> occurred to me was, I think we probably one of the very few universities, at least in this part of the world, where the Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor are actually females. Uh, Tessa Price is the Chancellor <laughs> and the Vice-Chancellor. Uh, and now, of course, we have the, the Deputy Chancellor, who's a female, and then the person who constructed the building won Women of the Business uh, of the Year Award. So it's all a female effort, it would appear, <coughs> at FNU. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, the, the, the Vice Chancellor and of course uh, the manager projects has said a lot about the building. I just wanted to contextualize that within the, the sort of wider Fijian economy and us as a, as a, as a country where we are headed. Uh, today uh, we have 70% of the population that's below the age of 40. 65% of the population is below the age of 35. So we're a very young population. Um, and I've said, you know, uh, somewhat jokingly, but it's factually correct, that when you have a young population, it means there are a lot more babies to follow. A young population biologically has the ability to produce more people as opposed to an older population. So we need to build sustainability in any policy that we develop, in particular in education. <coughs> You know, we have countries like Japan and Australia where the demographics is very much skewed towards the older population. You can go to Tokyo and you find a 70 or 75 year old packing your groceries for you in the car park pushing the trolleys. That's the age uh, skewering of, of the age their demographics. In Fiji it's very different. So you don't expect the population growth rate to be that high in Japan. Whereas in Fiji you expect it to be higher because we have a younger population. So, as a government, we need to think about the future, we need to build sustainability. One of the best ways, of course, uh, for any country to develop and realize its full potential is by investing in the people. And the best way of investing in the people is to ensure that they are educated or they have the requisite skill sets uh, to be able to contribute not only to their own lives and have a sustainable living themselves, but also to be able to contribute to the country. As Scope Construction would tell you, at the moment, companies like theirs are actually importing laborers or skills people uh, to work in the construction sites from Bangladesh. There's some people importing people from, uh, recruiting people from Indonesia or Philippines. Why is that happening? Because there is actually a skills gap. You have a number of reasons why you can have skills gap. One is because you may have people who are not interested in that particular space. In Australia, for example, at this point in time, there are many people, Australians, who are not willing to work or don't want to work in certain sectors of the economy. Recently, I was at a, um, you know, a, it's not an a, um, aged care facility, but somewhat, but also a care facility where people who cannot look after themselves, I went there to see somebody uh, in Sydney. Every single person that was a, 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 that was a caregiver was not an Australian. Every single person. They were from Indonesia, they were from Thailand, they were from Afghanistan, they were from other parts of the world. So Australians are perhaps not choosing to work in those sectors. There was a shortage of accountants in Australia this year. I was told by some accounting firms that 60 accountants in one month were recruited from Fiji. If you go to certain other types of areas, whether it's fruit pickers, where people who want to work in the hospitality sector in New Zealand, a few weeks ago there was an article saying that there's a shortage of about 63,000 people in New Zealand to work in the hospitality sector. There are certain restaurants that no longer open seven days a week or they're only open for lunch, only open for dinner, because there's not enough people who want to work as chefs, who want to work as waiters or waitresses. There's certain hotels people don't want to work in. 
On the other hand, there is a shortage of people in the technical areas, people working in refrigeration, various other sectors too. That's the dynamics in Australia and New Zealand. So we need to look at what are our set of dynamics. As a government, we need to think into the future. If you have a young population, that's why if you look at the scholarships that your Vice Chancellor mentioned, we have a number of scholarships now given for nurses, increase. Why? Because there's a shortage of nurses worldwide. The waiting time at a public hospital in Melbourne a few, hour, a few months ago was 24 hours. We get phone calls sometimes from people saying, oh, I've been waiting in the hospital for one hour, in the public hospital. In Melbourne, it was 24 hours, 12 hours for non-emergency cases. Why is there a shortage of doctors and nurses? Some people, because of the high levels of COVID, high levels of death in healthcare workers, people don't want to work in that sector. So people are poaching our nurses. We had one health center in Suva, without naming the particular facility, where six of their top nurses were hired in one week. They've gone overseas. What does that mean for that health center? We've got, got to get more nurses. If you're going to have more babies coming home, we need to have more training in midwifery. We need more midwives. So we have to anticipate, we have to plan. So those, that, those are a set of dynamics that we have to be able to address. So as a national university, this university is entirely funded by the Fijian government. Your capital grant and your operating grant is funded by the Fijian government. You of course collect fees too. But every other single dollar comes from the Fijian government. You don't get a contribution from any other government or any other agency. You may have some relationships that you may build, for example, the, the climate uh, school or the climate center that's been set up is a collaboration between uh, FNU and Monash University. And again, I mean, you know, that relationship has been built because of a former Fijian, an academic, one of the, one of the top 500 most cited academics uh, in Australia or in the world, I'm told. Dr. Narayan, who's originally from Nauvoo, went to Vashis Muni School, went to USP and became a gold medalist and went to Monash. Very young person who's cited globally. And because of his affinity to Fiji, he was able to develop the relationship and today we have that climate uh, center over here. We are of course at the forefront of climate change. In the same way as it was talked about uh, by the project manager, that when we build buildings, we need to ensure it's climate resilient. When we build buildings, we have to ensure that we are actually able to, are uh, able to, you know, put our hat or put our mouth where, where, where uh, what we are saying, and that is that we need to ensure that we have sustainable buildings. Because if we are telling the rest of the world to reduce the carbon footprint, we ourselves need to do that. If we're telling the rest of the world to use renewable energy, we ourselves need to do that also. So there's a whole collection of issues that we need to be able to address. We, of course, as a government, government have made commitment to continue to invest in the education sector. Now, there is, of course, some challenges. There are some people who do get educated. They do go overseas. That's fine. If you are on toppers, the only requirement for you if you're on toppers is that you work in your country that, have actually, that has actually paid for your fees. Toppers, you don't have to pay a single cent. You pay for your school fees, your university fees, your, your accommodation, your textbooks, your living expenses, etc. So if you're somebody who's done MBBS, we paid for that as through toppers, you have to work in Fiji for eight years. It's only fair. You don't have to work for government. You can work in the private sector also, as long as you work in Fiji. If you want to leave before then, if you worked in Fiji for four years, please pay us for the balance of the four years because you've got a lot more kids coming. The sustainable, sustainability needs to be built in. In the beginning, when we had tells, we lost a few million dollars because people told us, I'm just going overseas, I'll be back soon. Never to return. One way ticket. So we cannot have that. Same thing with tells. With tells, if there's a, there's a loan, if you pay that loan within the first three years, depending on what course you've done, you pay 50% of that, we write off the other 50%. We forgive the, the other balance of the 50%. Now, that's a very good deal. 
the interest rates are start from zero to 1.5 percent. It's not much at all because by the time you end up paying, you're not paying much at all. You're probably just paying for whatever you borrowed, if not less, depending on the uh, the depreciation rate of the dollar. So it's it's a good system that we put in place, and that sustainability needs to be put into the into place also. We are, of course realize and all of you realize that FNU is really a, a collection or conglomeration of different schools that existed in Fiji before. You have the Coronavia Agriculture School, you have the te Teacher School, you have the Derek Technical Institute. All of that has come together. You have the Maritime School under the Fiji National University banner. So FNU is very unique. FNU has the ability to excel in what, what generally may be called pure academic side of things, or pure academia, but also at the same time have that what generally is called the, the vocational side of things. And as we are seeing as the world becomes a lot more sophisticated, there's a lot more demand, um, there's a need to have that synergy between vocational training and also academia too. And we are continuously trying to push that envelope. And we want to work together, of course, with FNU to do that. Through TVET, you know, we have boat building in the remote maritime areas, we have carpentry skill sets. All of those things are critically important and we'll continue to invest in that. This structure here, as you can see, you can find this in, in ANU, you can find this in UNSW, or any other university in the world. Our philosophy is that we must produce a conducive or have a conducive teaching environment. Which means that your teaching environment is in the physical infrastructure, must be right. Your soft infrastructure, your accreditation for your courses, the ability to have the right syllabus, your, your lecturers, your tutors, they must be paid well. It is a well-known fact that FNU lecturers a few years ago weren't paid as well as USP academics. So we've tried to narrow the gap. And the only way that the academics and the university can get that excellence and get that international accreditation is to ensure that we have the right academics in place too. We have to ensure that the academics also follow international standards. They also adhere to the equal opportunity, non-discriminatory provisions that exist in our constitution. That's critically important also. So we must have the best teaching the best. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I wish to, and I can stand here and speak for the next few hours, but I, I don't want to make a very long speech, but essentially to highlight those issues to you. And when we look at the education sector, we also at the same time may not necessarily be relevant to you at this point in time, but we're also looking at how we fix up primary education, early childhood education, and also you know, secondary education. Because the foundations of education is critically important. How best your child knows to read and write in the first, first to fourth year is very, very important, as all studies have shown now. Unfortunately, in Fiji, for many years, that area has been neglected. Very much so. Secondary teachers, secondary school teachers are given more prominence than primary school teachers when really the primary education comes from the primary school teachers. So we need to, give, we need to elevate their status a lot more. And that's what we're intending to do. And the reason why I highlight this to you is because you are the largest teacher training institution. So the, so the courses available at FNU in teaching needs to obviously meet up with international standards. And we do not want a, a situation, a lot of people, when they wanted to, for example, pursue a particular course, but because they did not get into that course, they ended up just simply doing teaching, because that is the last resort. We need to change that, that, that approach to it. I, I wish to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank the FNU Council. Uh, we believe we have a very robust, very dynamic set of people with individual skill sets who are both from Fiji and also from overseas. Uh, who we believe and we have a lot of confidence in will set FNU into the 21st century. And now, of course, with the Vice Chancellor, I'd like to officially welcome you too. I've only had the opportunity of meeting her probably for a few fleeting moments 
uh, at some um, at the Fiji Constitution Day cocktail. But uh, we, we love to, of course, you know, stay in touch with you and, of course, develop that. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, I, one thing I'd like to also ask is, in particular, those of you who will be using this lecture theatre, these premises, the building is yours. Please look after it. In Fiji, we sometimes have this habit of, we love openings, cutting the ribbon, wearing the salu-salu, have a nice cocktail or whatever, but you come back to that building a year later, it's in shambles. It's not clean, it's not up to the standard. So it's, it's, we have to take pride. Uh, the, the, the people who look after this building have to ensure that we have to look after the building. The same way we said to when we re rejuvenated Nandi Airport, please make sure the place is clean. It's a very basic issue. Please make sure there's enough budget allocation to continue to have regular maintenance. Let's not fix up the seat when it completely falls down. Uh, it's a very basic issue, but let's, let's have that sense of pride. This university is yours. Uh, we want to ensure that it continues to be a center, a university, an institution of learning excellence. I wish you all the best. Thank you.